thanks everybody for coming. I'll try to share with you some of the things I learned and why I, I think it's a cool tool and um, help point you in the right direction if, if you were interested in working with it, maybe tell you about some aspects of it you hadn't heard about before. So uh, the big thing is why would we be interested in a gaming engine? We're not making games yet. Um, but, uh, <laughs> uh, oh, and by the way, feel free to interrupt me at any time if you have questions or, or anything. But um, so it's a game engine, and I guess my short answer is a game engine is a tool for making entire worlds. So sort of like what doesn't potentially find use in a game engine. Um, but really visualizations and working with 3D, working with AR, VR, and um, being able to prototype apps with all of that or make full, full on programs. That's what Unreal is really strong at. Um, it's supported on a ton of different platforms. Like you'll see this, this silly startup project I have here, um, like package project, Android, iOS, Lumen, Mac. And as we all know, it's never really that simple. There's always gonna be platform specific stuff, but it's pretty good at being able to be dropped onto several different platforms. So it's just, in my experience, the short answer is like, it's a, it's a fast prototyping tool to do things with 3D. Um, so along with that, there's lots of um, tools and training and things you get for, for free. Um, so like in this project, I've included starter content. So like um, we can go into props and, oh, look here, there's just like a lamp somebody made. And you just drop it in here. And now I've got like this lamp and we could, you know, make it an actual light in the scene or whatever. But there's just tons of, of resources, tons of pre-made blueprints and things you can work from. Um, and of course, building stuff like this, there's tons of visualization tools, but there's lots of like tested pre-built things. So, so working, not rewriting things people, other people have made. Um, as the company, I think they're really cool because they've sort of, uh, big picture, had a lot of success with the games they made from Unreal Engine. It was originally for Unreal Tournament and then from like Fortnite and, and just they've had more and more success. So in a sort of like AWS way, they've made a business out of their infrastructure, not just their games. And now they they just over time have brought down this, the cost to use Unreal to the point where now I think the latest is you, if you make a million dollars with something, you then have to pay like 5% of your, your profits or so. It, it, but it's gone from like, it's just, let's make this more and more affordable to the point where now like with the Unreal Mega Grants, right? It's like, hey, do you have a cool idea for a thing? Can we help pay for you to make that thing? even if it's not a game. So they're just, their attitude towards this has been very inspiring to me. Um, so, okay, we talked about the big picture of things it's useful for. Um, one other thing I just want to highlight is virtual production, which I'm sure everybody heard something about. Um, the idea is like to have a, um, instead of having a green screen and when you're making a movie and in post-production, uh, putting something back there, you actually will have a, a LED panel wall and project an environment into the scene, track the physical, the real camera so that the background moves realistically, has parallax and everything. Um, and so you have an environment that the actors can be in, be lit by, uh, you can sort of go, like the director can go, I want that mountain to be in a, like a different place. Can we like move that over? And they can do in VR, like interact with the background and move things around. So it's like this insane level of creative control. It's also this super collaborative thing where um, instead of having to be a more linear process to visual effects, obviously they're gonna be involved the whole process, but no normally it's like we go shoot the thing and then we go do VFX. Now those people are on set working with everybody. So it's a really, and with COVID of course, like being able to be, um, not have to travel around the world to film somewhere um, as you probably all heard, Mandalorian was shot with virtual production basically exclusively. So they might have built, built set pieces here and there, but most of it was all virtual production. And so the way you do that with Unreal is like you'd have, you know, in this scene here, like have um, a camera, like this camera here, and this is being driven by the tracking data from the real camera. And then you'd have like virtual screens, which is this plugin called N-Display, 
which would split up this scene into panels for a wall. Um, and then, um, uh, yeah, you could just interact with the scene and it would change things on the wall. So that's kind of like how it's used in virtual production. Anyway, this isn't really about virtual production, but that's one of the most exciting things that's happening with Unreal. Last thing I'll say about it is it's got this great leveling of the playing field where like somebody likes a 14 year old kid in their basement could make a world in Unreal and somebody else could go like shoot a movie with that as the background or they can make a game and share it with anybody. Um, so it's like this just in, in virtual production itself is also something so new that nobody kind of has all the answers. So it's only a few years really seriously being developed. So everybody's kind of new to it. Anyway, enough about virtual production. Um, so just how, how do you get Unreal? Like, let's just get into the like, how do you get started with it? Um, so I'm gonna close this actually. Um, so you actually, again, being built from Epic Games, which is the company that makes it, you get this Epic Games launcher program. Then from there in the library, you, you can like choose whatever versions you want, um, install them, launch them here, here's my projects. But the, and of course with Epic Games, you can buy Epic Games, but, or you could sell your games here. But the really cool thing with this is the marketplace. So here you can go find, of course it's gonna not load. Um, like here's just the free content, like, you know, mixed reality toolkit that somebody made that you can just get for free or like models somebody's made of something. So it's just a lot of like ways to get started quickly. Uh, anyway, we will launch my uh, project again here. And one thing to watch out for is uh, sometimes different, ver like you can generally upgrade a project to a newer version, but of course there can be problems with that. So it's actually good practice to try to um, name your projects like that, where you saw where you have the version name of what Unreal Engine you used in the in the name of the project. Anyway, so once once we're in here, the big parts of the program are you have this this place actors area, which is where you can grab like primitives, like a cube. I could grab an actor, um, a camera, all that kind of stuff is here. Content browser is more like custom things you've made, like instances of these things. So this is like where you saw where I found these lamps or um, some robot models I tried to import. That's a different story. <laughs> um, things you'd make. This is kind of like your media browser in like Final Cut Pro, for example. Out, the outliner is everything that's in this level. Um, so like, here's our character. Um, one really helpful specific tip is as you're playing with this, it's very easy to accidentally like move yourself out into the middle of nowhere. If you find something in your outliner and hit F, it frames up that thing for you. So that's a really good way to just like not get lost. Um, and then the details is this is of course all your details of, of whatever you have selected. Um, so this kind of format is very similar if you've used like Photoshop or Maya or any sort of digital content creation. This is going to be somewhat familiar. There's a lot more in here though, and it's sort of context-based and hidden. So this is kind of the, the basic stuff you see, but I'll show you more of it in a second. Um, so big picture, the way that Unreal projects are structured is you have your project, then you have these levels. It follows a sort of game analogy, right? Like we have levels and then we have actors in, in the levels. And an actor is a very broad term. Like an actor could be, of course, this character, or it could be like this cube that you run into and it plays the sound. So that's a very broad term. So you'll see actually, if you go, this is a little weird at first, if you take an empty actor and drop it into your scene, it's like just some sphere. <laughs> now, what you would do with this, if you want to make your own actor is like, put a static mesh, which is like some sort of 3D geometry on that and like nest it in here and make it part of that thing. Um, then there's uh, other things like controllers and pawns, which you'll see if you want to create a blueprint, this is kind of where you see like all these major classes of like the taxonomy of things in Unreal Engine. 
it's like you have game modes this is like how you define what a, like a win condition is or something a player controller this is like say if you wanted to have a um blueprint that can i know i'm saying blueprint not explaining it we'll get to that <laughs> but if you wanted to have some code that like controls i don't know a robot arm or something in your scene that would be like how you do that uh character is like usually the first person thing you're walking around if it's that kind of thing you're making the pawn is like you know some worker thing in the background that's moving around uh an actor is again sort of the, the top level of that of just it's a thing in your scene basically um so a couple quick notes about this scene um there's tons of ways to move around it so like what i'm doing right now and there's a list of this and plenty of awesome explanations so i won't go far into this but like you know just clicking and dragging your mouse goes in and out hold the other hold the right mouse button you can go left right up down if you are a gamer you'll recognize like wasd gets you around um then there's also again if you get lost it's easy to just like find something and hit f but there's tons of ways to move around the scene and then of course when you select something you get these handles to move it so like transform rotate scale um, and there's shortcuts for all of this but again kind of just leave that for that for this talk um so let's like see so if you wanted to like say we had built this this is actually a starter map but um when you hit play you get a you are now like playing the game or your project so now like the way this is set up just by default is like you can move around um so you know first you're going to start thinking like well what if i want to change this you would and this is where you get into what makes in my mind on this is the coolest thing about unreal besides probably the community aspect of it being first is the blueprint so I just found our character over here and I clicked on this blueprint. And what this is, and this is one of those windows that only shows that it's like one of those context windows. Like you only get it when you, you know, open a blueprint on a thing. Um, now this is a visual program language. So it's, it's node-based. I might've mentioned, maybe I didn't, Unreal Engine is all written in C++. So under sort of underneath all of this is, C++ and you can write your own nodes. But for so many things like here, let's capture an event and do, do something when that event happens. So these red nodes are an event. Um, and you could control these now. So you could like, you know, have it. So maybe you change one of these events out. So a different button does this action or um, Something I wanted to do is take like the first person shooter starter map and just change out the gun for something funny, like, you know, throwing a potato or something like you could, that's where you do this is you change out the behavior. Now this is a, a pre-made one. Um, so I will show you kind of a sim simpler one. Um, you'll see that you can add comments visually. So you kind of like draw a box around a bunch of things. And, um, and the way that this like works is you just, get these nodes you want and then you can control either execution nodes so like say when after this is done this will happen or you can pass values around so like here we're taking three individual floats and creating a taking them all in looks like multiplying them all together and then taking the output value here so this is like the reason this is huge to me is because this means people who don't know c plus plus can jump in and start building stuff Whereas before an Unreal Engine, you had to, to know C++. And so- Shane, the, I've got a question. Yeah. Sorry to interject. I was wondering, could you uh, walk us through the process of like that example you described? If you wanted to change out the weapon, is there a pretty straightforward way where you'd be able to just like look through the list of items in the, in the top right and find the right blueprint to go to? Or is yeah. that a tough example? There's nothing he's holding, uh, the, the character's holding in this example, but if there was like somewhere in here, there would be a blue node for getting that object. And what you do is just change out which object that's getting. And then on, you'd look for this red, whatever red node is like, you know, 
instead of jump input, it would be like shoot or something. And then you could change it to this function, which could be either one of these pre-made ones like jumping, or you could just make your own. Yeah, makes sense. Um, uh, let me pull up my, my blueprint. Um, so you see this cube over here that's rotating? It's just spinning in the right, that wooden cube that's spinning. That's something yeah. I set for the custom blueprint that's really straightforward. So I'll, I'll look at that. Um, so that is this. So I added this cube. And then the way I, I, I dragged a cube from place actors over here, then I clicked on, um, at the time it was add blueprint. And then over here in the outliner, now that I have that selected, add a blueprint. So you get two things. You get, again, this is similar to other things we do, right? Like here's your init script what you want to do on construction and then here's um tick so the way i'm doing this is i'm adding a relative rotation for every tick and i just set that it's a tenth of a degree every tick um so that's just a really simple idea and and the way like if i didn't have this and i'm going to break it um you right click in here and this gives you access to all the nodes so i'd say it was add relative uh, rotation for a static mesh. It was smart enough to grab my static mesh from up here. It knows that I'm working with a static mesh, but you could you can drag this down and this is like your this is like a getter method by just having this. Um, and then I just hook up the execution node to this and compile it and play and it should just do the same thing it was doing. Uh, looks like I broke it. <laughs> you didn't, didn't have a rotation specified. That's all. Your deltas are zero. Thanks, sir. Yeah. Thanks, team. So, yay. So, uh, you can see this gets really fun. Like, you can just play with this. Um, and it's smart enough to, like, if you, um, it, it'll kind of like cast things for you. Like, if you drag a Boolean into a string field, it will just cast the Boolean as a string and it will make a node for that. So then the other thing I did for this, just to show a blueprint example is, um, or sorry, to show UI. So uh, there's a thing called UMG, which is Unreal Motion Graphics. So if you go in and add uh, a widget blueprint on a user interface, that's where you get this window again very similar looking dialogue but this is a completely different um tool called umg where now i can like drag buttons over drag slots i can you know bind the value of this tooltip text or whatever to a variable and i'm just going to pull in my um one that's been in the oven here uh where's that so I made a, a really simple UI here. Um, you can imagine how this could get a lot more interesting if you added like sliders and they were jogging axes or something. Um, but it, I can go to a graph, which again, here's that blueprint editor. So um, this is a very, let's see. So on click on the button um, and to get that, I just uh, went to, uh, Somewhere over here, there was like on the button. And then I could, once I selected the button, I could add this event. And that's how I got that event here. Then print string, that note I got by just right clicking and typing print string and just kind of keep going right. So I take this character, character visible variable and just flip it every time the button is pressed. And then it's getting the active character um, and setting them as hidden. And then it's changing the, the button uh, text based on that. So if I run this, you'll see when I click it, it just changes whether the player is visible or not. And you'll, you'll see like there was a mistake where the button didn't say anything at first. So you know, if I just go back into that blueprint, um, so I could change that behavior. Um, so I would go to the designer and like, you know, set that this text 
would be there by default. So, I mean, it's kind of, this gets into like UI tools or like UI tools, a lot of other places, but this lets you um, by setting up a few variables, connect to things in your scene and like control them. Um, so, oh, uh, quick yeah. question on that. How are you handling the uh, mouse, either controlling the, the visibility or the direction that you're looking with your character versus being able to click on that button? Do you, oh, is there a way that you're toggling yeah. between that? That I think that's in the level blueprint um, as to like what what input does what and you can get into weird situations there if you like use the mouse input in several places right because in a game by default you don't even see your cursor right it just makes you move around on the yeah yeah so like this is a weird places. example where you maybe wouldn't want to you maybe want to have a smarter way to toggle between them um in okay. here yeah like, like a like, keyboard shortcut or something yeah yeah like now it's it's this isn't you know the you, like there's not a clean way right now. So that would be something you'd want to think about. Okay. Um, so last couple things about blueprints. Uh, they are convenient. They are about four to five times slower than the C++ equivalent of a function. So there's that downside and they're also single threaded. So if you wanted to do something like be listening to a you know, TCP stream and like pulling out positions and updating stuff in the scene, you know, you might want to have that in a background thread and be publishing it on a slower interval or have that kind of control. So that's where like the C actually writing your own C++ is really um, powerful. And to do that, it's pretty much as easy as going to new C++ class, choose what you want to write, and then it's going to like bring up your editor and you can start working. It's more, I think the thing to learn more if you're a programmer coming to this is understanding what you want to make. Is it a pawn? Is it a character? Is it a controller? And that hierarchy is a little weird to get used to because like, again, an actor can be so many things. Um, Those are like the base classes that have, you know, sort of like, am I making a, am I making a lamp that can turn on and off or am I making something that wants to drive around? Like those, those are the kind of just like the base things that you, we, you know, a programmer would need to learn sort of like, what are you starting with as an object class? Yeah, okay. that's really, Good way to explain it. There's also a Python API, which is more for things like, you know, automating that you want to import like a thousand instances of this one file or something. It's not as it, it's kind of used differently than the C++. It's it's just kind of like a different tool, but it's a it has a lot to it. Um, that's another way you can interact with this with code. Let's see, here's the sample. Code it came up with. So just like I had those nodes where you could pull off tick and, and begin here, there's just, here's your function you can start working with. And there's no plugin API either. It's just the entire source code of Unreal Engine is your API. So you use the same things, like you could use the same UI tools that you're using in the editor. It can get sort of meta that way. Um, so just to wrap up, a Couple of the downsides, uh, it is a huge program. <laughs> it can do just about anything. Like you can edit video in it, you could write programs in it, you can build games. Obviously like there's so much you can do ray tracing. So like it, it's, it's, a, it's a beast, but um, you also get all that power with it. So that's the down, so that's the trade off. The documentation, sometimes when you look up documentation for the version you're using, you'll get documentation from an older version they usually note it. I don't know if I have an example at handy, but they'll tell you at the top, but it's easy to miss. So sometimes you you find like the documentation doesn't match and that's why. Um, and then the other thing is version control. So they recommend using Perforce because of the large binary files that Unreal produces. Um, there are ways to use it with Git. And honestly, I haven't done a lot of version control with Unreal. So that's just something that, um, something to think about. And they really highly recommend using Perforce, but I like personally wouldn't want to use Perforce. So I don't know, um, something to look into. Um, but other than that, that's that's pretty much my crash course intro. I'll share a couple links of some really fun projects I've seen out there um, that aren't game related. Um, but yeah, hopefully this was helpful and feel free to hit me up with questions anytime.
Cool. Thanks, Shane. Everybody, round of applause for Shane's intro. Appreciate it. Looks very fun. Awesome. Yeah, it's interesting. It's almost identical to Unity. I used it for my one of my senior project classes, and uh, it's they're like the same thing. Like almost other than using C Sharp in Unity, it looks almost like identical dev tool. I'm not up on the differences. I started out with Unity actually. Um, one of the problems I had, for example, was they only had a camera object that it was like their their class for dealing with camera data was just called a webcam texture. Yeah. It's very limited what you could do with cameras. Again, that was about four years ago. So I don't know how it's changed, but um, generally the impression I got is Unreal seems to have like a lot of money behind it. And especially with virtual production, like they've just taken over that market. Mm -hmm. But I don't have a super detailed sense of what's all different between Unreal and, and Unity, but definitely similar tools in, in a lot of ways. Shane, for those of us who don't have um, 64 gigs of RAM, do you have any experience running Unreal in the cloud, um, like on a on an EC2 instance or anything like that? I, I don't. And I, I'm just on a MacBook Pro. Um, but I will show you one thing I forgot to mention, which is that you can, if you're finding that, there's all sorts of tricks in here to make it run faster if you're willing to like sacrifice quality. So for example, in here, we're looking at a fully lit scene, but you could look at an unlit scene. You could look at a wireframe. So that's the other thing is there are, and in project settings, there are tons of ways to, especially if you're doing like ray tracing, to bring down the quality or like reduce different. So there's all sorts of compromises you can make, but no, I've never um, tried it in the EC2. That's good to know that, yeah, you can, you can make those compromises. Is there a, any downside to running it um, in um, OS X versus a Windows VM? Like you're, you're running native in OS X, right? Yeah, well, I just found one. Otherwise I would have said no, but uh, <laughs> there's a plugin called Datasmith. Um, and what that is good for is bringing it, the idea is to bring in CAD without, comp, without like losing your hierarchy. So the idea is to try to like really seamlessly bring in all of your, uh, a CAD file. That only works on Windows. So that's a downside. <laughs> if you're in it. Oh yeah, I think I saw that. Yeah, I was griping about that. Um, and it the way it works is when you open the data smith, uh, I have the plugin enabled. Um, and you just go into here and there's there's no option for anything other than a U data smith file. So it doesn't really tell you it's not supported. It just isn't there. Whereas on Windows, there's an option. Um, I guess another thing I didn't mention is just how easy it is to make plugins. You can literally just go into plug the plugins window, click new plugin, and like start making one. And uh, the one point I really should have mentioned is that you can make content-only plugins or actually functional plugins. So they are a really good way to just share if you come up with something like an asset or a blueprint you want to share. That's the one of the best ways to do it is to just package it into a plugin. Shane, in terms of the CAD uh, import, can you not just? I mean, are you trying to like import them as native, like uh, like SolidWorks files instead of like changing them into like OBJ files or STLs or something else? Uh, it's more just that Unreal supports a ton of different formats. Like I think from one sec, FBX to Step to I, there's a huge list. Yeah. It's just that on Windows, they only support their native data Smith format. Or sorry, on Mac. On Windows, they support the giant list. On uh, Mac, they, I don't know if it's a licensing thing or what. Weird. Okay. Yeah. So, hey, Andrew, so back to your question on running Windows. I, so I've, I've run it both on the Mac side and on the Windows via Parallels on my MacBook Pro, and it has worked pretty well that way. And then I was able to get the, the CAD imports to work, which is actually the first thing I tried to do with Unreal Engine. And I was so frustrated, like, why isn't this working in the Mac side? And, and then it did start working when I tried it on the Windows side. Um, can, can you do the work on the Windows side and then bring it back to the Mac side? Or is it once you go uh, one way, you can't go back? 
that's what I was trying. And I think the answer is yes through a plugin. I think you could make a plugin, um, but it uh, involves uh, some. I, I, I can confirm you actually can do that. Like it, it, it just handles it. Um, I was able to do that last year. Um, and basically I just used data Smith to import them. And then once they were in there, like it was straightforward to just use them. You just open the project, the same project in Mac instead of windows. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And honestly, if you put me in front of unreal and it was, um, running on a Mac or running on a windows VM and you didn't, and I couldn't see, you know, what OS it was in. It's, it's, it's identical. I mean, there's that, this is the first thing I found that was different. I'm sure there's other things. But. The other thing I noticed is that there's a lot of like, um, this is just an experience here around uh, file formats was that like, especially with, when we were looking at Unreal Engine 4 in the last couple of years, like the back and forth between Blender and Unreal was, was clearly like a really well-trodden path. Like a lot of times we could like fiddle with the models in Blender and back and forth to Unreal. Like it seems to be expecting that that's how people would work with it. Um, you know, I, I see them taking on more direct like modeling and other elements like that Blender does within Unreal Engine, especially in newer versions as they grow it. But um, using using Blender side by side with Unreal is really is really was really positive, and we've done a ton of experimentation around like what's the best way to get CAD models and machine models into these into these tools. And there's a long there's a long thread and history and trail of a positive and, and failed experiments to to learn about if you're interested. Yeah, no, I, that's something I haven't done a lot of, and I, I'd like to know more about. Yeah, in our, in our playing around as well, like um, importing those CAD models into Blender. And then if you want to allow that CAD model to move um, through some input of your own, you need to set up some rigging. And uh, Blender does a better job or has a more complete process for rigging a model. Um, than Unreal. So once you've got your model imported into Blender, then you can set up your rig and then from there import into Unreal pretty easily. Yeah, I think I saw in the most recent, what, what 427, I think just came, came out a few days ago, they, they had said they upgraded some of those tools, but I'd imagine Blender is still going to be probably more fleshed out <laughs> because they've been around for a lot longer. You still have that precarious step of getting from, sur you know, boundary rep, B rep, you know, like CAD surface data into uh, OBJ or FBX or GLT, like any of the uh, mesh based things is always a little precarious. And like, even, you know, like we use Onshape a lot or Fusion 360 and like, there's different ways you can get out and they have all these weird kind of trade-offs. We haven't found quite the holy grail to go from CAD to that, but we do really like GLTF. And uh, again, I don't know what the latest, you know, there's probably other people, I'm sure there's other people that are more up, 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 up on it me lately, especially because we've been, we've been pounding on this for a while, but like, um, yeah, GLTF and rigging in, in Blender is a, a really, really good way to go. But usually that's like export mesh from CAD and then into Blender and then rig in Blender and get to over here. Yeah, if somebody had a demo of that or wanted, had, had, time to show me how they do that. I would love to see that because that's again something I just haven't done. Yeah, Ashley's done a lot of work on that, pioneering that and, and also Brian and Jesse have been have been working a lot on it lately as well. Anybody have any other questions for Shane? How's the, uh, the is there like the physics engine? So oh, like, yeah. Box a robot that interacts with the box or something kind of yeah i i had something actually prepared and didn't show it <laughs> show you just this is something really basic but just um first of all let's look at the real scene again so this box right now um doesn't have any physics obviously because it's just rotating in space i'm just going to click simulate physics and then run this again and you'll see it falls and bounces um, and it has its own weight, which I guess is determined by magic fake cube density, 
but you could you know set this to whatever you want and have it i'm guessing it's just going to land differently you know, make it one kilogram but so there's all these tools in here to do that um that's about as much as i know about it is that you can sort of turn it on or off as you need <laughs> and that there's a bunch of parameters you can customize that's that's what i know oh it's gonna fly away now i guess and that that's one of those things you'd consider like if you're really trying to optimize a scene is like, turning off physics for anything that really doesn't need it that sort of thing and with lighting that gets really important um i guess a really quick thing i was going to show too Again, as you've seen, the, the blueprints are like all over the place. So once you kind of get a handle on them, you can use them in, in some pretty um, interesting ways. This is actually a material editor. So again, same blueprints sort of editor, you'll see it just as material. And now I can take nodes, like I made this color node, um, I made a noise node, and I but I also took the noise node and, and put it into the normals uh, input. So there's actually some geometry on this otherwise um, flat cube. I'll just break this so you can see. Like it's a it's a flat cube. Um, oh, I put this in roughness also. And so you can get like really creative with this. Like it's a totally smooth cube, but then you can like take some function or based on anything in the scene and use that to create a material um, and affect the lighting the light not only the lighting but as you can see like the normals you can actually shape it with that noise I have a question for um, maybe Brian and Jesse. Where do we stand with the rigging for controlling robotic arms? Is, is that something y'all are still working on? In process, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think the last couple of weeks we haven't had an opportunity to um, put any time into it, but that's that's where we're going. That's a, the, our intent. Yeah, all, I have, at this point, do you all have a path where it's like, this is the way we have to go, or is it still kind of exploratory? Yeah, we're exploratory. exploring. <laughs> there's, yeah. there's actually quite a few routes you can take. Um, and so we're both stumbling through different routes, trying to decide what's the smoothest. Um, and at this point, neither of us have a have completed it start to finish in a smooth way. So we're trying to kind of work through those before we um, push it off to anyone else to play with. Yeah, my my biggest vic victory thus far was getting the GoFa robot CAD pieces into Blender and then rigging it so that it moves correctly with uh, with inverse kinematics like that. That felt like a big victory. It took a, took a lot of trial and error to get to that point. And then I got stymied at trying to get that into the into Unreal Engine. Um, gotcha. Yeah, again, that was a few weeks ago that happened. I just And I want to add, Dom, on, on the physics stuff you asked about, <laughs> one of my fun earlier explorations is I, I got, I think, some pieces of a robot into Unreal Engine. And it happened to be a first-person shooter like template. So it came with this like gun that like lobs a a potato or something like lobs a sphere right like kind of like a big dumb like paintball gun or something but i was able to get the robot to move by shooting this uh, this object at the robot and it would go uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> so anyway that was something i think anybody who has interest in this uh or those rigging topics um just just show up at the right zoom meeting or just reach out and volunteer i think i think anybody's contribution would be welcome i mean i think that's it's a really there's some there's some very interesting breakthroughs that are just very right on the edge of and yeah it's it's going to be really valuable when we figure that all out so don't be shy if you're interested in working on this just just ping, ping the people that you know are working on it and that, that's your way into it. And we have UDP comms with AR. So once we get the rigging working, we could go ahead and connect it to Synchro and whatnot, see how it performs there. That'll be a fun day when that happens.
just need to set up a hackathon. Everybody going to like rent a big house. Nobody can leave until that's working. If we can, if we can get enough attention at Epic, we'll just pivot the whole company to make robot video games. So that's what I'm working on. So right. I'll, I'll keep you posted on my progress. There we go. No more potato bagging machines, huh? We're only going to be shooting potatoes at robots to actuate them in the future. Yeah. Or if there's bags of potatoes in an Unreal Engine flopping around, acting like real bags of potatoes. Ooh, there you go. So actually- okay, hey, look, don't give away all our secrets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, our, our simulations could become a lot more realistic with the product handling. Cool. Well, Shane, thank you so much for your inaugural hashtag learning. We'll we'll yeah. be back for more soon. Thanks a lot. Everybody give Shane a virtual round of applause. Appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you, Shane. <laughs> Shane. We, we'll, and Shane, get ready for those middle of the night Slack messages about uh, when when people are at people are figuring out how to do this. So fair warning. Thanks a lot, Shane. See you. Right. Bye, everybody. <laughs>